Greetings and welcome to Ill Repute, the podcast where we uh, support women's rights, but more importantly, support women's wrongs. Uh, This is a place where we discuss women that lived interesting, audacious lives. Some of them were pioneers in their fields. Others were just master criminals. But either way, uh, they're worth profiling. They're worth adding to the canon, as it were. Uh, We have our own collection of heroes and villains, and it's time that we put them in their proper place. So uh, I am Sovereign Sire. I am a screenwriter, a stand-up comedian, and a former sex worker. And I am coming to you from traditional Tongva and Chumash land here in Los Angeles. And I am joined today by my co-host. I'm Ella Darling. I am a nerd, entrepreneur, amateur roboticist, adult film performer, sex worker, and um, kind of clumsy. If you're watching the video, you see that my arm is broken. Um, (laughs) And I am coming at you from, I believe, Tonka, Apache, and um, Comanche, or at least three of the tribes on the land that I am coming to you from. And we say this because it's important to acknowledge that the land that was here was not always you know, owned by colonizers, that it is important to recognize Native people and recognize that they are still among us. They're still here. They still deserve, you know, acknowledgement and recognition. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You are the conscience of this podcast. (laughs) And that that is part of why you're here, (laughs) because someone has to rein me in. (laughs) I, I think my favorite Thing you ever called me it was when we were we stopped at a gas station somewhere and like it was the gas station i go to and like i'm like catching up with all of the staff and you're like of course you're friends with the gas station people you're pollyanna <laughs> like, oh, okay i'll take it you are look at you just like a member of your community it's like <laughs> come on <laughs> Ugh, gross. that's time so um what do you know about calamity jane i know that she was a really tough woman from sort of the early west that yes. she was a gunslinger that she was she was a performer wasn't she yes yes and she was like a, sharp, a sharpshooter and so she performed in that regard i don't know a whole lot else because i worry that i'll accidentally pull from a fiction ya book that was sort okay. of inspired by her and yeah um, why don't you tell me Okay. Well, the reason I wanted to cover Calamity Jane is that I did write a screenplay about her life that we're looking to shop around as soon as the strike is over. But one of the most interesting things that I found in doing all of that research is that there really has never been an accurate or definitive story of her life, partly because she lied a lot and people around her lied a lot. So at the height of her fame, she was the most famous woman in the world. And after her death, there have been several people that have come forward claiming to have been her illegitimate children, just claiming like some kind of connection to her. And her story or the the myth of her has inspired many, many writers and filmmakers over the years. So there have been many movies made about Calamity Jane, uh, many things written about Calamity Jane, but almost none of them are actually historically accurate. I wanted to lay out what I think is actually a very fascinating life story. So this is going to be a long one. This is going to be a five-part series on Calamity Jane because she just did so much stuff and she was there to witness so many huge changes in the culture. So she entered onto the scene. She was born a little bit after the initial gold rush. She lived through the closing of the frontier and through man's first flight she saw a lot of stuff in in her lifetime and was an active participant in a lot of those things and so we bring you now calamity jane (laughs) i am this is the one that i'm most excited about because i think this is the one that sparked the discussion where you asked me to do the podcast with you yes yeah because i was like this has this story has to get out there yeah, I am so excited to to hear you teach me this. And it involves yeah. real journalism. I actually ended up doing a lot of original research, and I think I might have solved uh, certain mysteries around Calamity Jane. So, but we'll we'll get into that later. Um, God, you're cool. <laughs> <laughs> so our story begins in Princeton, Missouri. Martha Jane Canary was born May first, eighteen fifty six, in Princeton, Missouri. 
Her father's family was originally from Monroe County, Ohio, which was rural and sparsely populated by farmers. They were politically what would be considered libertarian today. Most likely the move was motivated by a desire to get away from the encroaching tensions around the slavery issue that was getting ready to bubble over into the Civil War. Her grandfather, Joseph Canary, was a widow, and he traveled to Missouri with his son, Robert, and two of his daughters and their husbands. When the family stopped in Iowa, Robert, then in his late 30s, met and married Charlotte Berg, who was only 15 years old. Some accounts say that he met her while she was working in a brothel or a dance hall, but there is little evidence of her existence beyond scattered reminiscences from surviving relatives and neighbors in Missouri long after Calamity Jane became famous. Married. She's 15 and married to a family that's like on its way. So not only does she get married in Iowa, but now she's taken away from her family. She's with Robert Canary and his dad and his sisters and their husbands. So shortly after the family arrived in Princeton, Missouri, Charlotte gave birth to Martha Jane. Joseph, that's Martha's grandfather, bought a large tract of farmland and sold it for next to nothing to his two daughters and their husbands. Robert, Charlotte, and Martha Jane lived with Joseph on his farm. So accounts of Robert and Charlotte paint a very dysfunctional picture. It was said that Robert was a lazy farmer and addicted to gambling and that Charlotte liked to go into town to drink and carouse, unable to let go of her past life in the dance halls of Iowa. This is bolstered by the fact that while he was supposedly a terrible farmer, Robert is listed on tax records as having more money than his siblings and in-laws. Over the next few years, Charlotte gave birth to another girl, Lena, and a boy, Elijah. It was during this time that Jane learned to ride horses and shoot guns, typical skills for a farm girl at the time. With her parents absent or drunk at night, it's likely she had to overtake most of the care for her siblings, a responsibility she would carry into adulthood. In 1862, Joseph died, and it was revealed that Robert had been embezzling money from his father and owed over $600 to the family. What would that be roughly today? <sighs> Do you have your calculator on your phone? I that would feel be a devastating amount of money, I would imagine. I'm going to ballpark it and say that would be like 20 grand by today's standards, like buying a car. Robert sold his father's farm to a neighbor and gathered up his family and took them on the run. Jane would have been six years old, and this was a harbinger for the direction her life would take. They reappeared a year later in 1864 in St. Joseph, Missouri, where they joined a wagon train headed for Virginia City, Montana. There had recently been a silver strike there, and Robert was gambling that he'd strike it rich. It cost about $600 for family to make uh, to make it across the trail, uh, the exact amount he'd stolen from his family. What is it with these historical women and their dads being fuckwads chasing, like, thinking they're going to get rich on, like, ore? They called it gold fever for a reason. I think it was as much as America was founded on this principle of we don't have aristocracy, innately what happened is huge class divides between mm -hmm. people. And mm -hmm. with the advent of the railroad and the frontier, it was a rare opportunity for people of any class to go out and by hook or by crook, by their own wits, by their own fortitude and endurance, could make something of themselves. So you may be, you know, a factory worker in New York, but you could save your money, take a wagon train, go out there, and you could get a you could get a bunch of acres of land from the railroad company for next to nothing, and you could build a house on it, and you could have like a huge farm. And if you were just industrious enough, you could really turn that into something. So I think people, it really captured people's imaginations. It was this chance to ascend class and to somehow American escape. Dream. Yeah, it really was, which is the, I mean, it's kind of the same thing during the age of discovery. Why would, why would people get on boats and come to essentially Mars, you know, and it was because it, it offered, there was this opportunity Likely it was going to fail, but there was a chance that you could come back with a lot of money. There was a chance that you could become someone in the colonies. And that really attracted a lot of people because it was it was the same situation. It was a chance to sort of escape your station in life. Mm -hmm. And turns out that that is a very uh, powerful drive for people. Yeah, Absolutely. Everyone started on the Oregon Trail. We went over this in the Olive Oatman episode, but we'll do just a quick. So the Oregon Trail was a historic immigrant route 
in the 19th century, stretching approximately 2,000 miles from Missouri to Oregon and used by thousands of settlers in the mid-1800s. There was actually so much traffic on this route that to this day, wagon tracks can still be seen in the land in certain places. It's really fascinating. Like there's a lot of artifacts still. Before setting out on the journey, pioneers would gather supplies such as food, clothing, tools, and essential equipment for the trip. Wagons, oxen, horses, and other livestock were necessary for carrying belongings and pulling the wagons. The trip was incredibly long and could take several months to complete. It was physically demanding and mentally taxing. Pioneers had to travel through rough terrain, encounter various weather conditions, and endure the challenges of crossing rivers, mountains, and deserts. The trail was not a well-maintained road. Instead, it was often just a wagon track across prairies, forests, and rugged terrain. This made the journey slow and difficult. Pioneers had to deal with muddy or dusty conditions, rocky paths, and uneven ground. They faced a range of challenges, including illnesses, injuries, and accidents. Diseases such as cholera, dysentery, and measles were common and could spread quickly within the close-knit groups traveling together. Medical care was limited, and access to clean water was sometimes scarce. When you mentioned that there's still... Uh wagon wheel tracks in the roads that you can see. Yeah. I can only imagine how incredibly difficult that terrain was, especially on a wagon, which wasn't exactly, you know, built for rugged terrain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just imagining how, like, how much panic <laughs> that trip must carry, like, at any moment, like, you know. I, I was, like, the nausea alone, there was no suspension on these wagons. Like these, these were not fancy carriages that had suspension and, and all kinds of stuff to like ease the difficulty of the journey. So you would be feeling every bump. And a lot of these things, you'd have to take apart the wagon and then ferry it across, mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of like taking things apart, putting them back together, taking things apart, putting them back together. Um, so it was very slow moving. I think that when I was doing research on carriage rides, it's, it's, if you were like on a single horse thing, you could get maybe like 20 miles in a day. If you were in a wagon or a conveyance, like seven. If you're traveling in a wagon train, you're looking at like two to four. Wow. Yeah, it's slow. Food was a critical concern on the trail. Pioneers needed to carry enough provisions to last the entire journey. Common foods included dried beans, bacon, flour, cornmeal, rice, and dried fruits. Hunting and foraging were sometimes possible, but not reliable sources of sustenance. Pioneers would set up camp each evening, cooking meals over campfires and resting for the night. Campsites were often basic, with wagons arranged in a circle for protection and livestock corralled nearby. Many pioneers traveled in wagon trains for safety and mutual assistance. Traveling in groups provided protection against Native American attacks, and fellow travelers could offer help in times of need. By Jane's account of this time, she spent her time riding her pony and hanging out with the guides during the long days and describes it as a joyful and carefree time. The Canary family took the overland route to the Oregon Trail to Fort Laramie, Wyoming, a major hub. While most settlers moved on to Salt Pass and Utah and further west, there were two trails that broke off at Fort Laramie and led north to the fields of Montana. The trail the family took was the Bozeman Trail. So the Bozeman Trail connected the Oregon Trail in Wyoming to the gold fields of Montana. Unlike the Oregon Trail and other more well-known western migration routes, the Bozeman Trail was primarily used by miners and settlers heading to Montana territory rather than settlers seeking agricultural land. The discovery of gold in Western Montana's gold fields attracted a rush of prospectors, miners, and settlers to the region. The trail provided a shorter and more direct path to the gold fields than other routes. The Bozeman Trail passed through traditional hunting grounds of the Lakota Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribes. This led to tensions and conflicts between the Native American tribes and the increasing number of white settlers and miners using the trail. The tribes considered the trail's construction and use as a violation of their territory. The conflicts along the Bozeman Trail culminated in what is known as Red Clouds War uh, in 1866 through 1868. Led by Lakota Sioux leader Red Cloud, the Native American tribes launched a series of attacks against the forts and settlers along the trail, aiming to force the closure of the trail and protect their traditional lands. And they were right. They were right, by the way. It was absolutely a violation of they did have a treaty earlier that had been signed in like 64, I think, that basically said the Black Hills are off limits. And this was absolutely a violation of that. Yeah. Just throwing that in there. <laughs> like, yeah. it, and that was correct. In an attempt to protect travelers and to maintain control over the trail, the U.S. Army established a series of forts along the Bozeman Trail. Forts Reno, Phil Kearney, and C.F. Smith were among the key military outposts established to provide security and supplies to travelers and miners. 
The escalating conflicts and cost of maintaining the forts led to negotiations between the U.S. government and the Native American tribes. The Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1868 resulted in the closure of the Bozeman Trail and the abandonment of the military forts. This marked a huge victory for the Native American tribes as the U.S. government agreed to abandon the forts in exchange for peace. However, when Jane and her family were taking the trail in 1864, it had only been open a few years. To get an idea of the kind of danger to be had on this trail is the story of the Townsend wagon train attack, which took place the same year that Jane and her family were traveling. So this is from the website legendsofamerica.com. Ella, you want to read some of this? In June 1864, several emigrant wagons were gathered near Richards Bridge on the North Platte River around six miles east of Fort Casper, Wyoming. The travelers were trying to decide whether to take the Bridger Trail or the Bozeman Trail to the gold fields of Montana. Many of them chose the Bozeman route, which was led by Captain A.A. A. Townsend and guides John Boyer and Rafael Gallegos. In the train were primarily emigrants from Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa. On July 3, 1864, 150 wagons comprised of 375 men, 36 women, 56 children, and hundreds of oxen, horses, mules, and livestock departed northward. After having camped along the Powder River, they continued northward when several Cheyenne and Sioux came upon them demanding food and telling them to return to the North Platte River. Though the warriors were belligerent, they left without incident. In the meantime, six men rode back over the trail looking for a man named Mills, who had been uh, who had left the main group to look for a stray cow. That sounds like fucking classic Mills. <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> I already hate this city. This city. Uh, <laughs> The larger train continued north. When the six men were about two miles east of the trail, they heard a shot and began to make their way back to the wagon train, but they were kept back by shots from the native fighters. The wagon train circled into a corral and posted men on the uh, on a hilltop overlooking the wagons. So kind of like not snipers, but like in the kind of protective sniping position. Yeah. Is that kind of what I'm thinking? Yeah. Okay. So basically we've got ourselves a little standoff. Yes. Okay, so they have corralled the wagons, and you've included some really great uh, illustrations. Yeah, and like, let me emphasize, the natives are correct. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Just just emphasis on, they the settlers are not supposed to be here. They are not supposed to be taking Mm -hmm. these roads. Like, Mm -hmm. they're not supposed to be doing this. So these people are defending their, their territory. Their dwindling territory, which has been slowly taken away from them by colonists over like many years. So yes, kind of really, really got it. But especially like the last 10 years. So mm-hmm. as Manifest mm-hmm. Destiny pushed people west. Well, also just with the discovery of gold in San Francisco in 1849, like that is when it really that's when things really ramped up. Okay. So it went from mm-hmm. scattered settlers looking to start a farm to hundreds of thousands of settlers making this journey in search of like gold. So right. it 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 like the number of of interlopers or what they would call like white intruders mm-hmm. which is how the, which is how they're listed on like the Dawes rolls and places like that. Like in a lot of like uh censuses from Indian territory they would be described as white intruders. That it was like an exponential increase. So there was a lot I'm sure on the native side of things a lot of anxiety around what what was coming what was on its way and what that was going to mean for their way of life whereas before it had been smaller less organized movements into territory like now we were looking at like a machine that was just constantly spitting out more and more settlers that were that were coming through. There was an account that when people first started taking the Oregon Trail, they would have to stop the wagon trains to let bison herds stampede through and like they would last for hours and they would be miles long. And within 20 years, those numbers had just dwindled down, not just from buffalo hunting by poachers out of trains, but settlers, as they are making their journey, would stop and go off hunting. And it would just like there just weren't enough resources for everybody. Yeah. So that's kind of what's going on. So there's a lot of tension, a lot of anxiety on both sides. Uh, an unwelcome trickle became a like life threatening flood. Of, yes. Of intruders. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
So of the men trying to get back to the wagon train, so we've got this guy, Asher Newby, who was hit with an arrow, but is going to survive. The natives are setting fire to the prairie around the, the circle of wagons. Kids and women are digging trenches. They're trying to bring buckets of water in. And meanwhile, they are being volleyed with rifle shots. The immigrant men were mostly successful. One named A. Warren was hit and would die the next day. But in the morning, another man named Frank Huddlemeyer, who had foolishly left the train to go hunting, was also killed. Once again, motherfucker, like, don't do that. Yeah. Another like, you're, you're, <laughs> like, yeah, like you're already in hostile area. You're already taking a short. Basically, they're taking a shortcut through a dark alley right. is what they're doing. Right. It's like right. you're not supposed to be here. So the bare minimum you could do would be like, you know, be respectful and like keep it moving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, fire rules. Yeah. Just yeah. like keep like keep it moving. Like don't go hunting. Don't go. Just get your ass across the trail. <laughs> okay. So another man was missing and presumed dead. The warriors kept up their attack on the wagon train until the afternoon before they finally departed. Captain Townsend then led the wagons about two miles upstream before they camped for the night. Of the man named Mills, who was wounded, who the wounded Asher Newby and five other men had gone to look for, his scalp was found hanging on a bush with his horse and cow nearby by the next emigrants coming up the trail. The immigrants believed they had killed about 12 of the warriors and wounded several more. So that's an off story, but that is what was happening on the trail either directly before, or directly after Jane and her family were on the trail. Like they were one of the first families to take this trail. And this is the kind of stuff that was happening. Mm -hmm. And her father was like, yes, I would like to take my family on the shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. When we talk about the benefits of disrupting the patriarchy, you know, one of the things is that women get to have a voice and say things like, are you sure about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that is that what we're feeling is the most prudent course of action or um, <laughs> also we could not do that. And um, we take a vote on, on the thing that's probably going to kill yeah. us. Exactly. Listen, I read the instructions, so I know you didn't, but. <laughs> The instructions said we're not supposed to go in there. So at the end of 1864, the Canaries had reached Virginia City, Montana. While they had headed up to the boom town to strike it rich, because here was the idea is you would hear about a strike and then no one knows yet we're going to go. So they're supposed to be getting there like hot and hot and early. By the time they arrived, it was already overrun with settlers, miners, traders, and merchants. So Virginia City was founded in 1863 after gold was discovered in nearby Alder Gulch. The discovery of gold led to a massive influx of prospectors and miners hoping to strike it rich. Virginia City quickly grew into a bustling mining camp. During its peak, Virginia City was a booming town with a population that reportedly reached several thousand people. So they get up there and it's supposed to be nothing. And there's thousands of people there when they arrive. Oh. It's like going <laughs> so, to the beach. Yeah. So the town featured a variety of businesses, including saloons, hotels, general stores, banks, and other establishments to serve the needs of the growing population. Like many mining towns of the time, Virginia City initially had a reputation for lawlessness and rowdiness. The lack of established legal and governmental institutions led to conflicts and disputes. Mark Twain, then known by his birth name Samuel Clemens, spent time in Virginia City in the early 1860s, working as a journalist for the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise, and began using the pen name Mark Twain during this period. That's just a little interesting side note. This kind of bodes for Calamity Jane's life. The same time that her family arrives in Virginia City is the same time that Samuel Clemens is there and that he begins writing as Mark Twain. She had so many encounters with people that it's kind of crazy that from the beginning, she was sort of blessed with this uh, constant encounters with legendary mythical people. So the main form of justice at this time were vigilante committees and seeing men lynched and hanging in the town square wasn't uncommon during the time that the Canaries arrived. In fact, a few months before their arrival, Jack Slade had been killed by one of these committees. Uh, I wanted to have you read another story. This Again, it's from legendsofamerica.com. This story is what it was like to live in these places at this time. This account of what happened to Jack Slade very perfectly depicts what people on the frontier were like and is very much sort of typical of the folk that populated 
the the boom towns that Calamity Jane would spend the rest of her life in. Right before they arrived in Virginia City, this guy had been executed in the public square. One of the best known desperados the West ever produced was Jack Slade, agent of the Overland Stage Line on the Mountain Division about 1860 and in charge of large responsibilities in a strip of country more than 600 in extent, which possessed all the ingredients for trouble. The language is going to be a little bit different. I thought it was important to capture sort of the tone and the vibe of the times. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so just kind of parsing that Jack Slade, famous desperado, uh, Agent of the Overland Stage. What is the Overland Stage Line? Um, just like you division? had the you had the Pony Express, you had Overland like mail delivery service. Which at that now we're like, oh, he's a mailman. But at the time, mailmen were like fucking heroes. Yes, they were like okay. getting it done through ri- through rain, through sleet, through hail, like all of that stuff. Like they were like a vital, vital part of life. Mailmen, station agents, like these were these people were became very, very important. They were they were your lifeblood. They, they connected you to the outside world. I'm glad you explained that because I wasn't sure. Um, in the heyday of his career, Slade lived just about the time when men from the East were beginning to write about the newly discovered life of the West. The hearsay men engaged in discovering the West always dung to the regular lines of travel and almost everyone who passed uh, across the mountains on the Overland stage line would hear stories about the desperate character of Slade. These stories grew by newspaper multi- uh, multiplication until at length, The man was the owner of the reputation of a fiend, a ghoul, and a murderer. Slade was born at Carlisle, Illinois, and served in the Mexican War in 1848. He appears to have gone into the Overland Service in 1859. At once, he plunged into the business of the stage line and soon became a terror to the thieves and outlaws, several of whom he was the means of having shot or hung, although he himself was nothing of a manhunter at the time. Indeed, all his life he killed but one man, a case of reputation beyond the desert, and an instance of a reputation fostered by admiring but ignorant writers. So I wanted to include this because this is so important to the social economy of the West is we think of journalism in a very specific way today. That is not what it was when it started. Rumor, conjecture, opinion, no fact checking, None of that. It was about selling papers, telling stories, second hand, third hand, fifth hand, didn't matter. It would get into the paper. Anyone could do a paper. They had things called one sheets. Printing presses had been made very small. So they were available in these little towns. Again, just like mail carriers and stagecoach drivers, uh, journalists, lifeblood of everything, right? That's how everyone got any of their information about what was going on. This is encapsulating kind of everything that we're about to enter into in the world of Calamity Jane, that myth making and mystique was very much uh, par for the course. And also that a lot of people that were lawmen one day were outlaws the next. And that was pretty common. There was a lot of ambiguity and ambivalence morally at, at this juncture. And people were kind of comfortable with that. Maybe it's because I, um, I'm not seeing through the the convoluted like journalistic language of the time why they call him such mean things he only killed one guy <laughs> like, that's a pretty low kd ratio <laughs> Your mer- his merc life balance is on point <laughs> <laughs> okay i love you <laughs> <laughs> So Slade was reported to have tied one of his enemies, Jules Benny, more commonly called Jules, to the stake and to have tortured him for a day, shooting him to pieces bit by bit and cutting off his ears, one of which he always afterward wore in his pocket as a souvenir. But he had been threatened time and again by Jules and was once shot and left for dead by the latter, who emptied a pistol and a shotgun at Slade and left him lying with 13 bullets and buckshot in his body. Jules thought he did not need to shoot Slade anymore after that and gave directions for his burial as soon as he should have died. This guy sounds so fucking jacked and awesome. He's like... Oh, he really does. Weakness, not bullets, I guess. <laughs> that you're gonna there's multiple men you're gonna be very impressed with in this story. It's okay. I'm sure they were all <laughs> absolute goes in their own way. Um, a lot of people, very hardy people, 
very hardy folk. At that, Slade rose on his elbow and promised Jules he would live and would wear one of Jules' ears on his watch chain, a threat which no doubt gave rise to a certain part of his ghastly reputation. Jules was hung for a while by the stage people, but was let down and released on the promise of leaving the country never to return. He did not keep his promise, and it had been better off for him if he had. So just a little light torture. We're going to hang you and then not hang you, hang you and then not hang you. So if you're getting an idea of what life is like in the West in a boom town, this is it. People are shooting people in the streets. People are being lynched in the streets as like a joke. Okay, we'll let you down if you leave town. That's justice. So it's yeah. important to understand the the context of like the world that Calamity Jane became a, a person in was fucking crazy. He's fucking, is he Rasputin? Like, he doesn't die. I mean, c- kind of. He, he's, he's, I'm guessing pretty great. Probably good. I bet he's, Probably I bet. Some, some real golden ones over there. I mean, his name is Jack Slade. I mean, if that's not a, if that's not a big energy name, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Jack Slade. <laughs> I'm surprised it's not a porn star. Eh, Slade is in the name. Mm. <laughs> So Jules Benny was a big Frenchman, one of the sort that early ranchers who were owners of small ranches and a limited number of cattle and horses, just enough to act as a shield for livestock thefts and to offer encouragement to such thefts. Before long, Jules was back at his old stamping grounds where he was looked on as something of a bully. And at once, he renewed his threats against Slade. Slade went to the officers of the military post at Laramie, the only kind of authority then in the land which had no sort of courts or officers, by the way, and asked them what he should do. They told him to have Jules captured and then to kill him, else Jules would do the same for him. Slade sent four men out to the ranch where Jules was stopping, about 12 miles from Laramie, uh, while he followed the stagecoach. These men captured Jules at a ranch a little further down the line and left him prisoner at the stage station. Here, Slade found him in the corral, a prisoner, unarmed and at his mercy, and without hesitation, he shot him, the ball striking him in the mouth. His victim fell and feigned death, but Slade, who was always described as a good pistol shot, saw that he was not killed and told him uh, he should have time to make his will if he desired. Baller. Baller. Oh, I <laughs> like, shot you. You're not dead. Do you want a pen? Okay. He straight up said, he straight up said, hold my beer. <laughs> um, and also, like, I'd say he is pretty well versed at what it's like to be shot and not dead at this point. So yeah. He, he sees that in him right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's color in the, the charge of deliberate cruelty, but perhaps rude warrant for the cruelty under the circumstances of treachery in which Jules had pursued Slade. Like, Jules was a quad. At least some time had elapsed while a man ran back and forth from the house to the corral with pen, ink, and paper. I called it. They really yeah, like, like he, yeah. He literally said, "Hold my beer." Uh, Jules never <laughs> signed his will. Uh, when the last penful of ink came out to the corral, Jules was dead, shot through the head by Slade. This looks like the cruelty of an unnecessary sort and like taunting a hapless victim. But let's reflect on all the shit this motherfucker did to this guy, and warrant for all the the Slade sort of stories seems to end. And there's no evidence of his of his mutilating his victim as was often described. Slade went back to the officers of Fort Laramie, Wyoming, and they said he had done right and did not detain him, nor did any of Jules' friends ever molest him. He returned to his work on the Overland. Back to mail. Back to... Yeah. That is what life was like in the West at this time. There there was no law. There weren't sheriffs. In reading through newspapers.com and like different things, a lot of times the judge would just be whoever everyone trusted in the community. And you would just show up to his house with your complaint and then he would just decide. You know, it just, there wasn't any kind of organized anything. It really was, I killed him. Okay, yeah, sounds like you did the right thing. That's what justice was like. You could see how this could be a really exciting place, a very dangerous place, but it was a place where people felt like they were ruling themselves. And that um, sort of good moral character was sort of what clothed you in safety. It was really kind of live by the sword, die by the sword kind of mentality. So very libertarian. Because sometimes the only thing you have to protect you is your good moral character. Like, would it be safe to say that in some cases that's just kind of stochastic terrorism and like weaponized press kind of yeah 
being a journalist was not a safe occupation. If you wrote some shit people didn't like, they would come drag you out of the office and hang you in the street. Calamity Jane was known to terrorize more than one journalist that she didn't like what they wrote about her. She would show up in their office and she would make them dance with her gun. She did not like reporters. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So after this event, Jack Slade grew more turbulent, was guilty of a high-handed outrages and general disposition to run things wherever he went. The officers at Fort Halleck arrested him and refused to turn him over to the stage lines unless the latter agreed to discharge him. This was done, and now Slade, out of work, began to be bad at heart. He took to drink and drifting, and so, at last, turned up at the Beaverhead diggings in 1863, not much different from many others of the bad folk to be found there. Quiet enough when sober, Slade was a maniac in drink, and this latter became his habitual condition. Now and again, he sobered up, and he always was a businessman and animated by an ambition to get on in the world. He worked here and there in different capacities, and at last settled on a ranch a dozen miles or so from Virginia City, Montana, where he lived with his wife, a robust, fine-looking woman of great courage and very considerable beauty, of whom he was passionately fond. However, she lived almost alone in the remote cabin in the mountains while Slade pursued his advocacy such as they were in the settlements along Alder Gulch. Slade began to grow ugly and hard and to exult in terrorizing the hard men of those hard towns. He would strike a man in the face while drinking with him, rob his friends while playing cards, ride into saloons and break up the furniture, and destroy property with seeming exultation at his own maliciousness. He was often arrested, warned, and fined, and sometimes he defied such officers as they went after him and he refused to be arrested which apparently a guy like that can just opt out of. (laughs) His whole conduct made him a menace to the peace of this little community, which was now endeavoring to become more decent, and he fell under the fatal scrutiny of the vigilantes, who concluded that the best thing to do was to hang Slade. We use vigilante to kind of describe like a much looser, not organized thing. So the way that they would deal out justice back in the day was they would form what they called a vigilante committee. And it would be the most respected people of the town and they would get together and they would decide that you needed killing. And then they would come get you and they would take you in the town square and they would lynch you. They would give you some killing. They would do killing to you. That's how they used to do justice. This wasn't like a formal organization, but you were either a member of the club or you weren't. Mm -hmm. So it's like if everyone has the one hated friend in the friend group and you don't think that about your friend group, you're the hated one. It was sort of like it was sort of like that where it was kind of like if you didn't know who was on the vigilante committee, it's because you were probably next. (laughs) So at this point, he had never killed anyone yet, although he had abused many, but it was sure that he would kill someone if allowed to run on. Moreover, it was humiliating to have one man trying to run the town and doing as he pleased. Slade was to learn what society means and what the social compact means. And uh, as did many of these wild men who'd been running as savages outside of an independent of the law. Yeah, they're about to, to get a real harsh lesson, I suppose. Uh, Slade got wind of the committee's deliberations uh, as well he might when 600 men came down from Nevada camp to Virginia City to help in the court of the miners, before which Slade was now to come. It was the Nevada camp vigilantes who were most strongly of the belief that death and not banishment was the proper punishment for Slade. The leader of the marching men calmly told Slade that the committee had decided to hang him, and once the news was sure, Slade broke out into lamentations. This was often the case with men who had been bullies and terrors. They weakened when in the hands of stronger power. Slade crept about on his hands and knees, begging like a baby. My God, my God, he cried, must I die? Oh, my poor wife, my poor wife. My God, men, you can't mean that I'm to die. They did mean it. And neither his importunities nor those of his friends had avail. His life had been too rough and violent and was too full of menace to others. He had had his fair frontier chance and had misused it. Some wept at his prayers, but none relented. In broad daylight, the procession moved down the street and soon Slade was swinging from the beam of a corral gate. One more example of the truth that when a man belongs to society, he owes a duty to society and else must suffer at its hands. This was the law. Slade's wife was sent for and reached town soon after Slade's body was cut down and laid out. She loaded the vigilantes with imprecations and showed the most heartbroken grief. The two had been very deeply attached. 
She was especially regretful that Slade had been hanged and not shot. He was worth a better death than that, she protested. Slade's body was preserved in alcohol and kept out at the Lone Ranch cabin all that winter. In the spring, it was sent down to Salt Lake City and buried there. As that was a prominent point on the Overland Trail, the tourists did the rat. The saga of Slade as a bad man was widely disseminated. While Martha was not directly involved in this story, this was the town they arrived in. Just imagine what it would be like being a little kid and entering a town where men are hanging from corral gates dead, <clears throat> where 600 vigilantes just come into town and swoop someone up and execute them in the street. It reminds me not, I mean, not in terms of like the society, but just visually sort of a uh, handmaid's tale, the way that they would, you know, just have people hung on a wall visually almost as a reminder to like participate in society the way that we expect you to or don't participate at all. Yeah. I mean, and that's very much how it was in the West. So you could see how like two working class people that were religious, this way of life would feel vindicating. Mm -hmm. Like, <clears throat> it's never going to happen to me. Um, here, everything is about your character. Everything's about your willingness to work. So you can see how it would be appealing to people that had felt very oppressed in their lives in the cities in mm -hmm. like back east, where there was no upward mobility. And it seemed that you were at the whims of a moneyed upper class that seemed to be completely morally bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So the idea of moving to a place where everything is fair, you could see yeah. how that would be really appealing to people that yeah. were seeking to escape, not just classism, but rich people and mm -hmm. intrigue and all the things that come with a more complicated and sophisticated social hierarchy. When the Canaries arrived in Virginia City, there was a competition to stake any claims and there was a long, hard winter. It seems that Robert Canary spent anything he panned gambling and that their mother was working as both a washerwoman and in dance halls or brothels. We know this because the Canary children made the local paper just after Christmas in 1864 when they were picked up unattended, begging for food. The following account comes from the paper. Three little girls who state their name to be Canary appeared at the door of Mr. Fergus on Idaho Street soliciting charity. The ages of the elder ones were about 10 and 12, respectively. The eldest carried in her arms an infant sister, a baby of about 12 months' age. Mr. Fergus, Mrs. Kastner, and Mrs. Moon kindly provided them with food and some clothing. Martha Jane would have only been nine at this time, and her sister Lena, seven. And the infant would have been her little brother, Elijah. Newspapers at this time didn't engage in fact-checking, and most news came second, third, and fourth hand. The paper went on to describe her parents thusly. Inhuman brutes who've deserted their poor, unfortunate children. The father is a gambler in Nevada, and the mother, who was last seen in town at Dr. Byam's office a day or two since, was a woman of the lowest grade. That's my favorite kind of woman. Mm -hmm. Fucking ditto, kiddo. Dare I say, of ill repute? Oh, <laughs> the rather damning uh, indictment lends credence to the theory that her mother worked in the sex trade to get by. I'm not sure what Dr. Biam was known for, perhaps abortions or treating drunks, but her presence in his office seems to be casting some serious shit on her. Yeah. When I was reading through the paper account, there's got to be a reason why they're mentioning this doctor. And the nearest I could figure is that he either provides abortions or provides treatment for people gone off the drink. There would be something mm -hmm. about it that would be shady. Yeah. You know, so... Or it could be STIs, which is yeah, the other yeah. side of the abortion point. Yeah, yeah. And and the, the thing of describing her as a woman of the lowest grade, I mean, that's pretty common double speak for a sex worker. Yeah. You know, so and here when they're saying Nevada, they're not talking about the state of Nevada, they're talking about Nevada City Camp, which would have okay. been which is where the um vigilante committee came for Jack Slade. They came from Nevada City Camp to Virginia city camp. Some of these towns don't exist anymore. So these were like, there's like five Virginia cities in the country. So, so going back to Dr. Bam, that reminds me of Dr. I don't want to say his name because I'm basically there's a certain doctor in Los Angeles. And if you work in a certain industry where pornographs are made, you've probably gone to see this doctor at one point or another for yeast infection or something. But basically if anyone mentions that like this is a doctor they've seen 
you know they're probably a hoe because that's the hoe doctor. His name's Dr. Rig. You can say it. Okay. It's Dr. Rig. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like Dr. Rig. Yeah. Yeah. So after this, the family moved around to different mining camps uh, with her father gambling and her mother working in the saloons at night and washing clothes for miners during the day. Jane helped her mother delivering laundry to different miners and town folk. It was around this time that Jane met Bill Bevins. He was in his late 20s and she was 10. I think we know why I'm saying that, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you don't really have to lay it out like that if he doesn't rape her. (laughs) So Bill Bevins had struck gold and was now known as Bevins Gulch. He would have been a millionaire by today's standards, but he spent it nearly as soon as he collected it. In 1866, he won so many hands during a night of gambling that his opponents shot him and stabbed him multiple times. And miraculously, he survived. He most likely met Jane when she was delivering laundry, and it is said that he, quote unquote, seduced her in the language of the day. That same year, her mother died in Blackfoot City, Montana. Would we like to discuss? <laughs> yes. So, so he in, seduced a 10-year-old. Uh, very good seductive skills. He must really know how to woo a bitch. And was he using some like aphrodisiacs or? Well, I, I the the... This came from an account of a compatriot of hers who had said it said that her innocence was taken by a man about town whose name is still on one of the gulches here. And through a lot of detective work, people came up with Bill Bevins and he will come into her life later. But he would have been in his mid to late 20s and she was 10 years old. However, at this time in the Old West, that would not have precluded her from doing sex work. It would not have precluded her from being sexually active. People would not have thought it was that strange. This was still a very long time ago. And so um, and we're out in the frontier and we're with like a lot of different religious everything. So they characterized it as like a seduction or a, you know, led her astray. Mm -hmm. Blah, 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 blah. Um, Something happened. Something happened. So, and that same year, her mom died in Blackfoot City, which is, again, around Virginia City. They were just going to these little tinier camps, right? After the death of her mother, Jane's father took his children to Salt Lake City, Utah. It's not clear why. He died a few months later. The cause of death hasn't been found. It's not clear exactly what happened, but the children were likely taken in by family or families in either Salt Lake City or at Fort Bridger. An orphan at Fort Bridger, she was taken in by Major Patrick A. Gallagher and his wife, Frances, in Miner's Delight, Wyoming. Gallagher was a prospector that had done well for himself in Utah and passed through Fort Bridger on the way to Miner's Delight. Jane was 11 years old and already wild. The papers recounted that her antics scandalized the town but don't specify how exactly. Whatever the issues were, the Gallaghers had trouble controlling Jane. And after a few months, the town took up a collection and put Jane on the Union Pacific Railroad headed for Piedmont. They, the town was just like, this little girl can suck so hard. Like everyone, like we're going to pass the ball, throw your, throw a couple bucks in. That's bizarre. How old, how old was she? 11, was she still, 11, 11, 11. So it looks like she got taken in and, you know, she was just a lot to handle if she's someone that had just lost both parents and had been sexually corrupted by an older gentleman. And now she was completely out of control of her life and circumstances. I can see how she would have probably been a lot to deal with. Obviously, at that time, they didn't understand things like trauma, grief, Mm -hmm. The understanding of human consciousness and how people are impacted by the things that happen to them was just not nowhere near where it's at today. So it's easy to imagine that she would be probably acting out um, if she was used to having a lot of freedom with parents that were really neglectful. Um, I'm sure that suddenly being around like upper crust successful people that probably had some fantasy of like her being a cute little girl. Uh, we're probably completely she probably did not react well to suddenly be being given rules if she was the person that was if she was used to being the one that was kind of in charge right as she was like the caretaker for her siblings and was sort of the one handling things i could see that suddenly being in a situation where she's expected to behave would be really difficult for her to adapt to 
yeah, I mean, their her, the parents were so negligent and such like aggressive, egregious alcoholics that at at you said she was nine when when she brought her siblings to literally anyone who could yeah. help them. Like, yep the the tra- the trauma of being that kid. Any single one of these things, any single one of these things would be so like understandable. But she's dealing with all of it, and then a whole town bullies her. And like kicks her out, like holy yeah, fuck. yeah. Around age twelve, Jane arrived in Piedmont and got work at a boarding house run by Ed and Emma Alton. She was hired to take care of Emma's son, who was an invalid at the time. By all accounts, she was a good worker and nurse, but on her days off, she liked to party in the dance halls with the sex workers and miners and soldiers. Because that sounds like the coolest thing place to party if you're going to party, and those are the best people to yeah. hang out with. At least the sex workers. Yeah. One day, word got back to Emma Alton that Jane had been dancing around at a party dressed in a soldier's uniform, and she exploded at Jane, firing her. It's not certain why this soldier's uniform was such a touching point, if it was simply the cross-dressing or the implication that to get to the soldier's uniform, she'd had sex with him. Either way, at the age of 14, Jane was finally out on her own. Wow. It kind of reminds me of me when I was a kid. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I I identified with her story, like, so much. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, I'm being feral. Yes. <laughs> I, yes. The rolling scum. All right. Okay. So newly free from oversight, Jane became a sex worker. She's uh, 13 or 14 years at this time. Mm-hmm. She stationed herself in Corinne, Utah, and rode up and down the Union Pacific, working as a maid, a sex worker, a bullwhacker, and most likely for the railroad. You're not going to just say that and not tell me what the fuck a bullwhacker is. They whip- I'm coming up with so many thoughts. None of them can be true. Like a cattle driver. Some of them could. Okay. Like a cattle oh. driver. Like I mean, it required like whipping and cussing and like all of that stuff. And mm-hmm. the th- the first thing that erupt- that came out about Jane is apparently she was sort of Shakespearean in her ability to cuss mm-hmm. and and insult people. Like she yes. was she was epic. She was poetic. She was Homer. She was. You know, she was Maya Angelou, um, but with her, you know? Yes. If Maya Angelou cursed, it would probably, this is how she would do it. But also she most likely worked for the railroad, like doing any kind of thing. Gender is like a luxury that you get to have after all your needs are met. Yeah. So out in the West, male or female, if you could hack it, Mm -hmm. you could do it. Mm -hmm. And no one said because you were pulling your weight. So she was able to enter into these much more gendered occupations and it wasn't a big deal. Mm-hmm. It wasn't uncommon. If you could work and you could do the work, you would do the work, you would get hired. And and that's that's what it was. Right. And she was, as we've already established, King Farrell. So she became part of what was known as the rolling scum. The rolling scum were gamblers, musicians, whores, and other ne'er-do-wells that went from boomtown to boomtown entertaining the miners and soldiers on payday. Among them were, according to the Cheyenne leader, Mag and Mall, Gentle Annie, Moss Agate, the school marm, Mormon Ann, and Crazy Jane. And all the pioneers of vice to keep the dance going till the town has danced away again to another point. Those were all real names. <laughs> so before she was Calamity Jane, she was Crazy Jane. Fuck yeah. Again. <laughs> I, I really. I, were they all, were they, what was, were they all women? Well, that's listing off whores. Yeah. Oh, okay. Whores. Okay. Mag and Mall. So I'm taking it. That's a. It's a that's a duo Devils. of that's a yeah. duo of whores, Mag and Mall. <laughs> Gentle Annie, it's another whore. So she's, she's the hooker insane. with the she's the hooker with the heart of gold. Mm-hmm. Moss Agate, she's, she's the, the witchy she, one. She's, she's the witchy one. Tattoos. The school marm, she's the dom. Mm-hmm. Mormon Anne, she's the one that's gonna pretend she's a virgin. And then Crazy <laughs> yeah. Jane, which is like, she's crazy. The it must be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> So Jane made the paper multiple times for her antics. Like this newspaper account from the Frontier Index on June 12th, 1868. Quote, one of the town mollies was on the rampage yesterday. She made the feathers fly, drunk as a fiddler's tinker. She bawled and she squalled. Never before did we see the like. 
and another report a few weeks later that reported 32 arrested, quote, upon the various charges of drunkenness, disorderly conduct, and firing pistols, and females on the streets in males' costume. <laughs> It seems that Jane was still in contact with her siblings because in between all this craziness, a man named John Borner, who hauled supplies between Salt Lake City and Salt Pass, met Jane while she was working at a hotel. When he broke his leg, she helped take care of him and haul supplies for him. When he found afterwards to thank her, he found work for both Jane, her sister Lena, and her brother Elijah at a local hotel. Jane didn't last long on the job, a running theme in her life. But Lena and Elijah stayed on, and eventually Lena married Borner. Wow. Cool. The next four years of Martha Jane Canary's life are shrouded in mystery, and we'll be covering them next week as we watch her rise from orphan to the most famous woman in the world. Are you excited? I'm so excited. I love this. She is a (laughs) baller. Like, I think she's, I think to me, she is one of the most fascinating historical female figures because she's just such a hot fucking mess but she got it honest Mm -hmm. like born feral just like like from the gate the next part is probably my favorite part so i'm super excited for next week uh and to share this with you because this is where i did all the original research kind of stuff and like i'm very excited about my thesis (laughs) this is kind of i feel like where we started with this podcast, this conversation. And I didn't realize that we were writing theses <laughs> until until I was already like s- through the gate signed. I moved in, I the lease is signed, and I'm like, oh shit, I'm supposed to measure up to this. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, I'm I'm doing like journalism. I like no, you I of... just <laughs> but like I mean, also because I was right, I wrote a screenplay about this woman's life. So, I mean, I really had to get in the trenches and like, like really like dig through the sludge and the silt and like pull up at like the, the seaweed root like of yes. the soul to, to find kind of a through line for her. Um, and I'm just so excited to share the rest of this with you. This, I mean, I, I wrote this script in uh, two days. I was like... Yeah, wow. like just like I was like, we're doing it, it we're doing it. <laughs> I love it. It's wow. self-indulgent. It's five parts, but you know what? It's it's our podcast, not not yours. So yeah, and and she seems like a real badass, feral <laughs> ass, bitch. and like I'd, I'd invite her on as a guest if she were still around, and I didn't think she'd like make me dance with her gun. <laughs> I, I think what I do is too close to journalism. Oh, I th- I, oh, I think she'd like you. <laughs> oh, I think she'd like you. <laughs> You know all the right things to say, Savi. I, I do. I love you too. All right. So I will see you next week. And we will right. do this again. All right. Sweet. Bye. Bye.